Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. Um, just welcoming you to another Friday worship. Um, so I just want to start off with some promises of God for you. Lamentations 3, verse 22 uh, to 23 says, The faithful love, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Um, and Jeremiah uh, 32 verse 40 and 41 it says that I will make an everlasting covenant with them I will never stop doing good for them I will put a desire in their hearts to worship me and they will never leave me um, these are really wonderful promises of God's faithfulness and how he not just wants to do good and how he does good and not just how he's committed to doing good to us but that he delights in doing good to us and I know that um, during this season it's hard to see that at times when we're faced with so many challenges uh, but I'm reminded of Joseph uh, who started off in slavery uh, and God turned it around for his good where he became a powerful leader in, his, in Egypt and then we look at Ruth who we're looking at at the moment who started off with a husband that passed away um, no future, no hope because Naomi couldn't provide another husband for her because she was too old but God is faithful and God rejoices in doing good over us. And in the end, we see that Ruth uh, finds love with Boaz and is in the lineage of Jesus. Um, so I just want to encourage you. God is faithful. God rejoices to do, you, to, um, do good to you. Um, and don't give up on, on God. Embrace him in your situations. And just know that he is faithful. So I just pray that through this worship that God will open your eyes of your heart to know and to believe and be confident in his faithfulness to you. God bless you. Changes not thy come. 
Good morning, church. Today we're reading Psalm 127, a psalm of ascent, a psalm of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds a house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand, watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offerings a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. Amen. Psalm 127 a psalm of ascent, but this time it's a psalm of Solomon. It's a special psalm. I like to read the beginning of verse 1. Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless God starts what we're doing, it's a waste of time. Psalm 127 is the eighth psalm of ascent, and that's the number eight represents new beginnings, just like the eighth day after creation. That was when man started his work. That's when mankind started what God had given us to do. And so when we take a look at this eighth psalm, we need to see it as a psalm of beginnings, where we come and ask God, God, begin what we're doing. So when we take a look at this, we see God talking about new beginnings. How is God going to sustain our beginning? When we come to the house of God for help, we get special help from God to sustain what he has started. And I see Solomon overlooking the construction of maybe his house, maybe the temple of God. And as he watches the temple going up block by block, he's saying, unless you build this house, God, it's not going to be any good. And I think he also is saying that about his own house took 13 years to build that. And he's saying, God, unless you build my house, it's, I labor in vain. There's two key themes in the Psalm 127. The first is, let God build the house. Let God build the house. And secondly, God defends what he is building. When we take a look at God building his house, we see it as a physical building. We see the temple laid out there and he says, God, you build this house. But it's also about families. In verses three, 2, 3, and 4, it's talking about children. Children being a heritage. God, you have to build our own family and house as well. And we come to the house of God to ask you to do that. The second thing we see is that God defends what he builds. If we see in verse 1, we say, Unless the Lord guards the house, they labor in vain. Who, who, the watchman labors in vain. Yes, God has to sustain what he builds. Secondly, we see that God defends what he builds in our families as well. And we talk about that in verses 4 and 5, of how children defend us at the gates. God, you defend what you build. For us today, when we look at what this is saying, start our beginnings by seeking the house of God and seeking God's blessing. Come to the house of God and ask for God's blessing. That's what the Psalm of Ascent is for. Secondly, we see God as the one who builds. He builds the house that he desires and we build that as well. Secondly, we see him building our families and we come to the house of God saying, God, you build and sustain our family. And finally, we see God as the sustainer of his work in our lives, the work that we do and our families. Is he the sustainer that you come for? Psalm 127 says he's the best watchman. Let's pray. Father, unless you build a house, we labor in vain. And we thank you that you build the house and you ask us to be part of that. But also for our families, you build and sustain. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to welcome everyone to our online service of the AAEC congregation. 
I pray that the worship and the time of singing and welcome of Anita would have been one that really prepared your heart to come and be part of the service today. Today is a special service. We're going to be having communion today. I encourage you to make sure that you have your elements prepared. We will be taking it at the end of the service after the message. Right now we're going to go to our time of prayer. And this time I'm going to be using Psalm 116 as the prayer that we use, or the psalm that we use in our prayer. Psalm 116 is a special psalm. It, it talks about taking the cup of salvation. And I encourage you even now as you prepare your heart for communion, as we come, let's, let's take time. Let's just take the time that God wants for us today to be ready so that communion becomes a moment of special significance for us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in your word, David said, what shall I return to the Lord for all the goodness, his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and will call upon the name of the Lord. Father, that's such a powerful, powerful word and today, as we prepare to lift up the cup, we take time to pray. We take time to look back, to look at our present reality, and to look forward. And all of these are found in this psalm. And as we come today, we do not ignore the needs of the people around us. Lord, they're very important. But guide us through this psalm as we we look back at things that have happened over the past weeks and days and maybe even months. And Lord, we want to take time and look at it through your eyes. So Father, as we look back in verse six, in this Psalm, it says, I was brought low, but the Lord saved me. And Lord, we take time right now, even as we prepare our hearts for communion, to do as Jesus said, to do this in remembrance of him, to look back, remember his death and his resurrection, the death that Jesus died for each of us to bring salvation. Father, we look back and we remember how low we were. We were dead in our trespasses and sins and Jesus died for us. We remember the salvation he brought to us. We remember what we were like without Jesus. And we go, God, we thank you. <laughs> we are a thankful people. And as we prepare to lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord, we remember from where we came. Father, if we take a look at our present reality, in this psalm it says, I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, and he inclined his ear to me. Lord, that's our present reality that you hear us when we pray. You hear our pleas for mercy and grace and you release that. You turn your ear toward your children. And so Father, we lift up your name over a series of situations. Lord, for, for mercy for your people. There are many, many of your children suffering at this time. Father, we lift them up and cry out to you for mercy for them. Oh, that your heart would be poured out in favor to your people that are struggling. Lord, we pray for the mercy of this city, this land, this region, the rulers of our country here and the rulers of this region. Father, they need mercy. They need mercy so much. And Lord, we lift them up and ask in Jesus' name that as we call out, you answer and release mercy. Lord, we pray for protection for your people. Lord, around the world at this time, there's some real serious challenges. I'm thinking of Turkey, where many of your people who have been reaching out to those people have been kicked out. Many in China who are now facing serious persecution and other nations even in this region who who face serious persecution because they choose to put their faith in you put a hedge of protection around your children i pray father we pray for eyes to be turned to you at this time father we see so much destruction we see it in china with the floods we see it in nations where there is pestilence and 
and locust swarms. And, and we see it all over the place with this coronavirus. And we say, God, open people's eyes. Open their eyes to see. Give your children the words to say so that people see that there is a God who is behind their desire for, the, for protection. Father, they can't do it on their own. They're going to try, but they can't solve these problems. These will be solved by you. So give your children a boldness to, to pray out loud, to pray into situations, even as we are doing now, and give the people of this world ears to hear. Father, I pray especially for China with all of the deep, deep problems they're facing. Oh God, open their eyes for Syria and Lebanon as they're going through deep financial needs and health needs and, and famine needs. Lord, protect them. Lord, for Libya, for Turkey, for Iran, for Yemen and the world as they deal with this coronavirus. Lord, we lift them up to you. And Father, even as we lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord, we cry out for mercy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Father, we look forward as well. Lord, David said here, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? What, what can I do because of all the good things that you've given to me? Well, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord. Lord, if your people have made commitments to promise to do things, Lord, may they keep those vows in the midst of your people. We will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. Father, as your people choose to be a thankful people, as your people choose to be an obedient people moving forward, May we end up being an example to our world of what it means to be a people who walk in obedience to your word, filled with your grace, walking in your mercy. So Father, today as we prepare our hearts to lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer, because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, AAC. Do you want God in charge of your life, your situation, your family, your finances, your everything? Well, Psalm 37 verse 5 says this. It says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him also, and he will do it. The first thing that it said is to commit your way. That's a decision we must all make. When we commit our way to the Lord, we take our hands off of it. The next step is to trust in the Lord. Trust is a continuing attitude. And the third step is the Lord's. He will do it. He will bring it to pass. So this morning, we commit our way to the Lord. We commit our finances to the Lord. We trust in Him, and we know that He will do it. Father God, we thank you for our offering today. Father, I thank you that you would bless it, that you would multiply it, and you would use it for your kingdom and for your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Ruth 1, verses 6 through 22. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. 
Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Good morning, AAEC. This morning I would like to read for you from the book of Chronicles. And I'm reading from 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 33, and it reads, Moreover, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a far country for the sake of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray in this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel. This is Solomon's prayer as he dedicates the temple. And I wonder if Solomon had Ruth in mind as he wrote this passage. Scripture says that Ruth was a Gentile, a foreigner, she came from a country outside of covenant with God, and yet she committed her life to him. We see Ruth's declaration to Naomi in Ruth chapter 1. She says, For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. The scripture speaks of Ruth's unwavering commitment, and at this commitment, the blessing is commanded. Ruth experiences a personal transformation, and her faith is increased way beyond family and cultural ties, way beyond her own personal desire for children and family. Ruth's commitment and obedience transfers her from foreigner to direct ancestor of Jesus Christ. Her life becomes a testimony for generations to come. And as Solomon dedicates the temple and prays that God hears the cry of the foreigner, Ruth, who came as a foreigner, is a role model and a reminder to us 
of how God can use us to fulfill his will. Solomon's prayer is that there will be many, many more like Ruth. May we, like Ruth, be a testimony for many more to come. And may they experience the mighty hand and the outstretched arm of the King. God bless you. Thank you, Melanie, for that review of the background of the book of Ruth, especially as it relates to how God wants we as Gentiles to come to God and to, to faith. And Ruth is such an amazing picture for you and I today. Also want to thank Elder Best for reading the passage and for Kimberly for the prayer of offering. Again, if you need to have help getting your offering, please just contact Helen and she'll be able to assist you. As we come to the story of Ruth today, we're going to be talking about commitment. Being committed to God. How does commitment start? As we look at this, I want to just read the passage in Ruth chapter 1, verse 14, where Ruth makes a real powerful commitment to Naomi. Ruth replied, Do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Where your people are, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. We might often hear these words in a marriage ceremony where marriage vows are given between a husband and wife. And as we look at those vows, we see just how powerful they are of making a commitment to stay together no matter what the cost. Commitments. Have we made a commitment and pulled back because the cost was too great. Let me ask that again. Have we made commitments and pulled back on that commitment because the cost was too great? In reality, most of us have. But what we're going to see in the story of Ruth is a woman who kept those commitments at great, great cost. And as we stop and look, there's a lot to be lost when we make a commitment. Imagine what Ruth would have lost if she pulled back. Let's just take a moment and pray as, as we go ahead with this message. Father, as we look at Ruth, we're going to see things that are really powerful. We're going to see a woman who made great, great commitment, and the cost was great. But she's stuck to her commitment. Lord, give us eyes to see what that takes. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we have the three women. They're on their way from Moab to the land of Israel, to Bethlehem. And along that journey, as they get started, Naomi stops. She said, I want you to decide what you want to do. Because you see, Ruth, and Orpah have chosen to leave their land, land of Moab, and go to Israel. To leave their culture and their gods and to go to the land of Israel and to follow Jehovah. And this is an amazing commitment. We looked at this last week. And I just want you to take a moment and just marvel at the willingness of these two young women to follow their mother-in-law. What was this commitment going to cost them? Well, there was lost opportunities. They committed to come despite lost opportunities. Naomi says to them, should I have a husband this night and have children, have a son? Would you wait all those years until they're grown up and have my son as a husband? No, no, don't be foolish. And so Naomi encourages them to go back. Not the cost of those lost opportunities are very great. And they are confronted. Naomi confronts Ruth and Orpah with the reality that they will not have a husband from her children. It's just not going to happen. Secondly, we see that there is a commitment despite active discouragement. Okay, there's actively being discouraged from their mother-in-law. 
She says in verse 12 of chapter 1, Turn back, turn back, my daughters, and go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Not only is it too long a wait, the reality is nobody's going to want to marry me at this time. So go back. There is active discouragement by Naomi to these two women to say, go back home. Don't wait here. Go back home. There's not going to be any hope that I'm going to have these sons. And it's better for you to go back to your families and start all over again in your own country. Boy, that's God's people saying to the Gentiles, it's really not worth following God. <laughs> Go back. There's active discouragement. Thirdly, commitment. Despite when others leave and we are alone. All right. Orpah has chosen to go back. Naomi is saying, Ruth, you go back. She is all alone here. Ruth and her commitment is all alone. Look at what Naomi says. See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return. Go with your sister-in-law. <laughs> There's Ruth standing all by herself. Orpah has gone. And now her mother-in-law is saying, go back. And she says, no. <laughs> no, I am not going to leave you. I am going to go with you, even if everyone tells me I am foolish to do so. Fourthly, a commitment when our welcome is uncertain. So they get from Moab and they come to the land of Israel. They come to Bethlehem and there's a big uproar. Everybody's excited. Is this Naomi? And she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. Just stop and take a look at that. Here's, here's Ruth standing beside Naomi, and everybody's welcoming her, and she is just full of bitterness, full of hurt, full of wounding. Can you imagine the kind of welcome she feels as a foreigner when the woman she is going with and committing to is full of bitterness? You know what it's like to have a bitter person around you after a while? You just go... You stay over there, I'll stay over here, we'll be just fine. But I'm not going to sit and have a bitter person in my life. Bitter people are not welcome in a community. So there is Naomi, and her only person is Ruth. And Ruth has an uncertain welcome because she's stuck with somebody that the community is going to shun. So we see Ruth is doubly isolated. She's isolated because she's not a Jewish person. She's isolated because she's with a bitter person. Commitments at last are made, how? Before challenges begin. Let me say that again. Commitments at last are made before the challenges begin. You see, Ruth's decision to stay with Naomi was made long before any of these challenges to her commitment were made. She had made that choice and she was going to stick with it. Don't ask me to leave. I'm not going to leave. Where you go, I'm going to go. Don't ask me to stay back. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I am choosing your God. And I don't care what you say. I don't care what my welcome is. I choose to do this. And Naomi, where you die, I'm going to die. And where you're buried, I am going to have my burial plot right beside you. That is a commitment that she made to Naomi that was long before any of these challenges came to her. Okay, let's take a look at Ruth and her commitment. Ruth, in the face of deep cultural pressures, leaving a country, leaving all her family, having Orpah leave, having her mother-in-law say, go home, she said, no, I am going to follow God. I am going to go with you, Naomi. Even when it looked like God had left her desolate. God had taken everything away from her. She said, I am going to follow God. 
I don't care if I'm standing alone. I am going to follow God. I don't care what it costs. When godly people discourage her, she said, I don't care. Naomi, you can tell me all you want. I refuse to leave. In the face of uncertain accept acceptance, by the people, she just said, look at, I am going to follow God. When we take a look at Abraham and the commitment that he made, God knew that Abraham would have to make that commitment to, to be obedient, but he did it. Not so much so that God knew, but so that Abraham knew in his own heart that commitment was strong. So what keeps us from keeping our commitments to God? What is it that you and I need to be strengthened, to stay strong in our commitments? Well, first of all, we need to strengthen our spirit. We need to take time and keep our spirit strong. How? Pray. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to, to give us the strength to be diligent in, and faithful in what he asks us to do. As we pray for other people, pray for their strength, we strengthen our own hearts through prayer. We strengthen our hearts through reading of God's word, hearing what God has to say to us. I challenge you every day, you read God's word. Secondly, or sorry, thirdly, renew our commitments frequently. When you have made a commitment and you're struggling, stop and just say, God, you called me to this land. You called me to this situation. God, you're going to give me the strength to be your child in the midst of it. Strengthen our spirit by renewing our commitments frequently. Secondly, be prepared for challenges. When we stop and look at the challenges we face, we see Ruth as the model for Gentile faithfulness. Here is a lady who left everything to follow God. She's a model for you and I as people of the nations who are following God. We have left everything else in our world and chosen to follow him. Let Ruth be your model of faithfulness. Thirdly, take communion. The bread represents the body, but it's also the bread where Jesus says, my body is true bread. It will give you strength. And if you struggle, come, take communion. Strengthen your spirit. Strengthen your commitment to follow God. Communion is powerful for that. It's a combination of looking back and seeing what God has done for us. And it's a looking forward to saying, God, my commitment will still be strong in the future. So let's pray as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning. Dear Father, we see in Ruth a woman who made commitments and despite great challenges, she kept those commitments firm to the end. Father, she's a model for me and every one of us here today. And Father, Jesus, when he instituted communion he said do this often <laughs> it's a it's a command where jesus recognized we need to go back and look at jesus and the commitment he made to us to die for us to take our sin and we recommit ourselves afresh to walking in purity and walking in without sin in our lives and it's a combination of looking forward as well to the week ahead of us, to the month ahead of us, and recognizing that this will strengthen our commitment to follow Jesus all the way to the day that he returns. So bless your people as they prepare their hearts, their spirit, and the table. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to welcome you to the table of the Lord. It is not the table of AEC. It's the table of the Lord. I encourage you at this time to uh, prepare the elements, to put them there in front of you so that as you prepare and walk through the, this time, 
I encourage you to be mindful of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Don't take this in a casual way. Recognize that any time you take it, God wants us to be different, to change. The bread will be blessed by Elder Matthew. I encourage you to prepare your hearts as he does that at this time. The Lord Jesus, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples and said, Eat this. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Father God, we come to your table, O oh God Jesus, with humble hearts, O oh God Jesus. Father, you told you are the bread of life, O oh God Jesus. Whoever comes to me will not go hungry, O God Jesus, and whoever believes in me will not be thirsty, O God Jesus. Father, we quieten our hearts, O God Jesus, and we think at this moment the pain and suffering you endure on the cross for our sins, O God Jesus. At this moment, we just want to say thank you with grateful hearts, O God Jesus. Father God, and we thank you for the gift of eternal life, the unmerited favor you have given us, and your abundant grace and mercy, O God Jesus. O God, now as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we want to proclaim the coming of our Christ and Savior. And we remember that you have made a kingdom and you have promised us that we will have communion with you in life everlasting. Let's partake of the bread. Thank you, Elder Matthew. And now at this time, I'm going to ask Elder Allen to do the cup. I encourage you this time to take the cup, just as we listened to earlier, take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Elder Allen, please. We'll be reading from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25 and 26. In the same manner, he also took a cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us pray. Thank you, Father God, for the blood of Jesus that shed on the cross of Calvary for our healing, deliverance, freedom, restoration, and prosperity. Thank you for our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Thank you so much. Appreciate all of the support and help that the elders have been given. Keep them in your prayers. They have busy schedules and, and I just, they're helpful beyond measure. Continue to keep them in your prayers. As I have shared last week in the benediction i'm going to go through first peter chapter 5 because it's such a critical one to see a, how god wants to use suffering to release blessing so for our benediction i'm going to be reading first peter chapter 5 verse 10 and 11. so may the god of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by christ jesus after you have suffered a while perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.